continue to look to the new administrative rules. Uh, in addition, we also have the Interagency Committee on Administrative Rules. This is a group of uh, employees from within the state that look over a new rule just to ensure that there aren't rules coming from different agencies that are at cross purposes or that are overlapping or that are conflicting with each other. Um, and then you have the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules who the assisting in what we they look at whether the agency has authority for um, creating the rule, the consistency of the rule with legislative intent, uh, looking at public input into rule, the rulemaking process, and then any economic or environmental impact. And then, of course, we also have members of the public and external organizations and stakeholders that will be providing input throughout the rulemaking process. The steps of the rule adoption process. Just so you know where we are right now with Rule 7 is we are right before step number one. So the first step would be to pre-file with the Interagency Committee on Administrative Rules to get the ball rolling there. Um, once we finish with ICAR, then um, we're going to, excuse me, after we pre-file with ICAR, we also subsequently file with the Secretary of State, which will send a copy of the rule to LCAR. The rule will then be uh, posted on our website. There are also additional notification requirements that have to be met so that the public's aware that a rule is taking place. There will be a uh, public hearing and comment period, which I will get into in a later slide in terms of details of the length of public comment period. Um, and yes, the length of public comment period. And then once we have finished going through public comment, we've engaged with stakeholders. If there are any changes that should be made to the rule, we will work through those. We will bring the rule back to the board for um, and request approval to move forward with filing a final proposal, <coughs> excuse me, a final proposed rule with the Secretary of State and LCAR. Then we will meet with LCAR, who will go over the rule, ask us questions, um, and then we may or may not see the need to adjust the rule based on feedback from LCAR. And again, there will be another opportunity for the rule to come before the board. Um, at step seven when the board adopts the final rule, which will subsequently be filed with the Secretary of State. I went through that kind of quickly. If anyone has more questions, um, please feel free to ask when I wrap up here. So rule seven specifically, as I said, um, the state statute requires that we adopt a rule covering the basis and process for removal of a member. Members of the board may only be removed for cause per the state statute. Uh, I think it goes without saying that we hope this rule is never used, but we are required to have it and so we are working through adopting a rule. Rule seven addresses the basis of removal for a board member, the process for removal, and then addresses some specific issues regarding confidentiality throughout the process of removal and also some due process considerations for board members. Um, if anyone in the audience is interested in looking at the draft rule that is posted online with the agenda materials from today, <clears throat> this is, uh, the draft rule is uh, where we are right now and what we're asking for the board's approval to move forward. I would recommend that for people who are looking to provide public comment, it might be helpful to wait till we post the proposed rule, um, which would be hopefully within the next month. Um, so moving on to public comment and additional stakeholder input. So after the board approves a draft, we're going to send out a copy of the rule to the Office of the Healthcare Advocate and any other interested stakeholders. In addition, members of the public are welcome to submit formal comments as soon as the proposed rule is posted to the board's website or sooner if you wish, but just so you know that you're commenting on the proposed rule, you may want to wait until that is posted, specifically outside of our agenda materials for today. Then per statute, a public hearing will take place no earlier than 30 days after the proposed rule is posted online, and public comment will be accepted for at least seven days following the public hearing. So right now, just so that the board has some idea, we're 
we're looking at a time frame where we're hoping to have the proposed rule publicly posted in April and then accepting public comment through May with a public hearing towards the end of May. This timeline, of course, might be adjusted depending on um, if ICAR has suggestions or modifications to how we might receive public input or if there are any additional changes that are requested by stakeholders that we need to consider further. So, and with that, our recommendation is that the board approve draft rule seven and direct staff to proceed with the rule adoption process for rule seven. If there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Maureen, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I do not. Thank you. So at this point, we'll um, take any uh, public comment or questions on the discussion on Rule 7. Seeing none. Yes. Okay. I will happily move that we approve draft rule seven and ask the staff to proceed with the rule adoption process. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve draft rule seven, version one, and direct the staff to proceed with the rule adoption process for rule seven. Is there any discussion? Discussion. So, Mike, again, if you could call the roll. Sure. Member Yusper? Uh, yes. Member Holmes? Yes. Member Pell? Yes. Member Long? Yes. Okay. Yes. Let the record show that it was an unanimous vote. And thank you very much, Amber. Thank you. and we're going to invite the uh, next uh, presenters to come down front. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brina Holmes. I'm a general pediatrician and the maternal and child health director for the state um, of Vermont at the Vermont Department of Health. So thank you so much for inviting me today. I, I feel like could someone keep track of time? I, this, I could talk about this topic all day. I, my goal today is to uh, pique your interest in some of the depths of this conversation. Certainly won't be able to address the, um, with the time allotted all of what's going on in Vermont and how we're approaching this topic, but I do hope it leads to more conversation. Uh, the first, what I'd like to do today is very, very briefly touch on ACE's study and really shift us a little bit into the adverse family experiences, which is there's a nuance there talk briefly about how public health is approaching the prevention of ACEs really by promoting protective factors and strengths in families. And then uh, quickly end with a very hopeful example of how we're moving forward in our state. The um, kind of quicker way to say this is I'd like you to come away today thinking about strengths instead of ACEs. I'd also like to have everyone leave today knowing that the pediatric medical home is one of the best venues in our system for addressing strengths in families. And I'd also uh, want us to all be excited about the pilots that we're doing with our One Care partners in this arena. So just a reminder that the ACES study was about adults. It was not about children. It was an incredible study for its size. But we forget to, we don't remind ourselves very often and how often we talk about this, that this was about white adults 
who had college educations. So this was a middle class cohort. And in that setting, it was super important, groundbreaking research to name that when these particular seven experiences had been documented by adults in their memory of their childhood, uh, they had chronic disease associated with these factors. So uh, this was not meant to be at all disparaging of this incredible groundbreaking study, but it was described and continues to be our frame in the context of adults with chronic disease. So the nuance here is super important to me that we get it, right? Childhood adversity has lifelong consequences. But I want us to be grounded in the fact that chronic disease is only one of those consequences and the prevention of adversity in childhood is more complicated than those seven factors. So people a lot uh, smarter than I am about eight years ago said, well, let's talk about the adverse family experiences, EFs, <laughs> and let's uh, actually ask families about their experience as families through the National Survey of Children's Health, which is a really, really rich data source if you're a data person. And it actually has its national data also, and Vermont, each state has its specific data. So the family experiences actually add in I tried to highlight here, but I can't see. Beyond what goes on in an adverse childhood screen, which is the ACES study from Dr. Folletti, the family experience asks about poverty, which I'm sure you can imagine is a form of adversity. It actually asks about the death of a parent, and it goes on to talk about violence in a more uh, community way, not just whether there was violence in your home, which is an ACE question, but what about your neighborhood? Did you experience racial inequity? And what about moving, which we could talk about a long time, but moving frequently is a major stress on a family and a child. OK. So that's all I'm going to say about ACEs and AFEs. I think Tom might address it uh, with deeper detail, and there's a lot more to say. But what I want to say is we can screen people for ACEs, and a lot of people are interested in that, and that uh, has its merits. What I'm interested in as a pediatrician is asking families about their social complexity. And the more common term for that is social determinants. Uh, the word determinant has some issues for me, but social complexity. What's happening in your family with food and housing and transportation and safety, and economic opportunity finances. And then I added the last one because we're doing a beautiful job in Vermont putting a full spotlight on the fact people don't have access to high quality affordable child care for their kids. So isn't lack of access for childcare a stress on a family and a social, it involves social complexity. So I guess the agitation I want to make today and point out is so we already know that adversity in childhood has lifelong consequences. Today's talk is not about brain development. I think maybe you've had some of those experts talk to you. I'd be happy to talk about that at another time. The brain develops uh, very rapidly in the first three years of life, and the exposure to toxic stress is, it has lifelong impact. So since we now know this, I am continue to be concerned and want policymakers to help me understand, if we know this, why aren't we doing more about it? And that gap is what I think Green Mountain Care Board has a great opportunity to uh, lead the conversation. And I know that you're spending a lot of time talking about primary prevention, and I just want to support that, that we really, we know that we need to do it, and we just have to find the courage to do it. So the other thing about this slide is um, sometimes people describe that we don't know what kids and families need, and I really want to oppose that publicly and say that there's no mystery to what works, at least with our littlest kids, and yet uh, we have trouble investing in it. So, huh. uh, I want to shift our language around. I don't want to talk about ACEs. I think that many of you knew Paula Duncan. Paula was my mentor for my entire career, and uh, she taught me and continued to remind me that, that we need to talk about what um, is good in families, where the strengths are, and that when we continually layer adversity on people were missing the opportunity to shift our trajectory as both a child, a family, and a society. 
super complicated slide, except maybe it isn't, that we're all born with a certain potential. Epigenetics, it's some really interesting science behind this notion that our brains and our genes have some predetermination and then there's some expression. So if you think about where your trajectory was going to go, sometimes the adversity shifts you down. So that when you do experience those circumstances on that list of aces, your potential as a human is shifted. But let's talk more about what lifts you up and all the opportunities that a public health system and a society and a community has to provide these opportunities for, for young developing brains to change the trajectory. So it's really just a math equation. The more we layer in parent education, high quality pediatric health care, early care and learning, safe neighborhoods, the more we're going to mitigate the effects of the toxic stress. So some of our national friends are, are better at describing this as balancing ACEs with HOPE, which is an acronym for Health Outcomes for Positive Experience. This is where all of my interest and attempts to, um, to shift the conversation are, because it's not really about putting all of this on a family. It's talking about how communities can provide the opportunities for these experiences for our young people. I also um, hope you've heard of the Strengthening Families Framework. All of I, the reassurance for you today is that these things we talk about are layered and connected when we talk about hope, strengthening families, the, the people that build these frameworks talk to each other and there's tons of science and research that when families have these five protective factors, ch children thrive and even more ultimately there's way less child abuse. So I, I didn't really have time to do all five but I'm going to go really quick and to take the words in the frame and then try to say it in more sort of common language. Parental resilience means that you have to manage stress, life is hard, and that you have to figure out a way to function even when times are difficult. Our nurse home visitor uh, trainer said, you have to parent in spite of. You know, we, kids don't really have, we don't have time with developing brains to say I'm gonna get my life in order in the next five years because the um, development of the child is real time. So that's resilience. Social connection, way, way missing in our current society especially in a rural, isolated place like Vermont where we have trouble with transportation. So let's care about each other's kids more and let's get and give support and understand that networks of caring people is good for kids. Understanding child development is really a lot of the work we do in the Agency of Human Services, but it's also the work of pediatricians, which is the more you know about what's happening with your child in a normal developmental way, the easier it is to parent and the more you understand. And none of us really know how to parent, so that's kind of a nice grounding principle. Surrounding Vermont families with adults who have some skills around parenting is a, a super goal. Concrete supports, this is sort of the social determinant work that we care so much about. It's very hard to parent in the context of food security, insecurity, housing instability, lack of transportation. And then social emotional competence, this is a wonky thing, but this really means how do we teach parents to support their kids' feelings and emotions. And many of you know that uh, Vermont has high, high rates of kids with emotional disturbance in our public school system. And that's just, I don't like that term, but that's what the term, emotional disturbance. And we believe deeply that understanding the emotional lives of children when they're little would impact that metric. Okay, really quick. Or maybe not so quick. I put this up for Jessica Holmes. <laughs> it's the Heckman equation. Uh, I'm OK that things that pediatricians have known forever got called out in, in the world of economics. And the economic folks uh, named this opportunity that the younger we intervene, the better the rate on return. And uh, this man won the Nobel Prize. I also wanted to reassure you today that um, I think from where you sit, you probably hear a lot of disparate presentations and wonder if there's integration. These are sort of the top five things I'm working on in my public health leadership role right now, and they're all related, I promise. So help me grow Vermont, I'll touch on for one second at the end. We're gonna we can talk a lot about 
home visiting, which we recently rebranded as the term Strong Families Vermont. Developmental understanding, legal collaboration for everyone, the Dulce model I am going to dive into with a couple slides. Building flourishing communities is um, alive and well and really a concept about how communities can support families. And then I, I think that the uh, current energy around childcare is extremely hopeful and exciting. Okay, so here's how we think about our work in the agency. And this uh, is integrated work between Secretary's Office, Department for Children and Families, the Health Department. We believe that the opportunities and the access points for Vermont's children in the most primary prevention space are in three domains. Kids are in their home. We are really lucky in Vermont. We have very few brand new babies who are homeless. So there is an opportunity for families to access and work with families in their home. Pediatric medical home, highest rate of well child care in the country, and we cover all kids in our Medicaid program. I mean, truly almost all. And then, sorry, that's like a weird yellow lime. Early care and learning programs, lots of different data on this. 50, 60, 70% of Vermont's children when they're teeny teeny are in some sort of early care environment. So these are your domains with our integrated service system in the middle for those families identified in those domains that may need access to more services. And then we do our Help Me Grow system, which is really about, it's a system of support for child development in all those domains and for families themselves. So today I want to just describe the access point of the pediatric medical home with our Dulce model, and that if we're, for families that we identify in that setting who could use some more sustained longitudinal support, we promote home visiting models. Many of you know that Bright Futures is the preventive service guideline for the care of Vermont's children. It is not building Bright Futures, which is our state council for early childhood, but you know, all related, but not the same. Bright Futures was commissioned out of the Maternal and Child Health Bureau 20 something years ago, partnered with the American Academy of Pediatrics to set standards for how we should take care of kids in the office. All three of the editors of this national guideline are Vermonters. Joe Hagan, Judy Shaw, and Paula Duncan. So we're very lucky that we have those experts. We're also really lucky that uh, some of you in the room or on the board were part of the policy changes in the 1990s that led to such high quality pediatric care. We cover kids to 300% federal poverty, and all the pediatricians in the state of Vermont take Medicaid. That's, a, that's not true in any other state in the country. There are tons of pediatricians nationally that see commercially insured kids. And I, I, we have to say that in every meeting so we don't lose traction on that. Because if we didn't have that coverage and that access point, and we didn't have such an incredible workforce, we wouldn't have the quality of health care for kids that we do today. The other thing that's really, really cool about Bright Features is that it evolves and it has additions. So the fourth edition came out in March of 17. And it said very aspirationally, I think you should screen for social determinants in every visit. And the pediatrician said, that's great, we really will, but you've got to figure out how to help us with what we're going to find. Because if we're going to ask every family and checkups about food and housing and violence and substance use, we need a whole network of people to help us. So what we love about pediatric health care is we have the access point because Vermont's awesome. There's no stigma when you get, bring your kid to the doctor. It's actually a social good. You have a, if you're having a very difficult, chaotic day, but you still manage to get your kid in, if that's, that's good. And we also know from research and, and uh, experience that people trust their healthcare professional. So we took this on the road. Did anybody come to the road show? We had a fun road show. The AAP paid for eight regional dinners. We had 264 human service partners come to these dinners with, with 48 healthcare providers all around the state. <coughs> and in the dinner, we, we put forth that the fourth edition of this pediatric preventive service guideline was suggesting and uh, recommending that kids be screened for social determinants. And I thought, as a healthcare provider, the human service colleagues were going to say, you guys have all the money over there in healthcare. You figure it out. And that's not what happened at all. The human service colleagues in the room said, we've got you. We will come into your office, or you come find us. And when you find stuff going on with the families in your practice, we'll, we will pick them up for you. But what every pediatrician in these and the family practice docs that came said, 
we need to increase the capacity in our office because we want warm hand We want everybody to move real time together through the, the results of these screens. We don't want this to go into some referral bin or somebody's queue. So luckily, we had already, we already had an experience in the Lamoille Valley about Dulce, which is developmental understanding and legal collaboration for everyone. This is a national model with evidence that when you put a family specialist into all well child visits for babies zero to six months, you can get families connected to the resources they need as early as possible to improve the health outcomes for, and the developmental outcomes for their children. So I have tons more to say about Dulce, but I just wanted to draw this metric so you can see how it all connects. In Lamoille Valley, the Dulce family specialist sits in the pediatric office and meets all the new babies. And we're not speaking in hyperbole when we say we have offered this service to 350 families and maybe two have said no, or three. You know, there's lots of data here if you want us to come back. So over the last few years, we've recognized that this is an acceptable form of human service integration for families. They don't mind it. And then the hardwiring of the family specialist to the parent-child center is genius because that person goes to the CIS team every week and says, I met 30 babies this week. 10 of them have these needs. Who's picking them up in our service array? And many of the families would benefit and are offered home visiting because we're a rural, isolated state and people are in their homes. So the rebrand, we've, we've had parent-child center, family support workers, and nurses from our home health agencies doing home visits for many years, but it was super confusing to people because it took too many sentences to say, I'm a nurse home visitor and I'm going out a long, long time for a longitudinal way, or I'm going out twice, or I'm a parent-child center person. So we pulled it all together in the Agency of Human Services to Strong Families Vermont Green, and then in our layered of who's the professional going out and how long are they staying, we changed colors just for the graphic. But what we know about home visiting is even more than we know about other things. For 30 years, we've researched this approach to families strengthening families. And what we know is that that relationship that you build in a home with a family of a new baby improves all of these outcomes and more. So again, since we know this, I still I really need help understanding why we're not investing more in it, because home visiting moves mountains for families. And then I already mentioned this, but we do have a fun wraparound system called Help Me Grow, which involves um, early childhood professionals, including doctors, communicating with each other about developmental results for screens through a registry, which is part of our immunization registry at the health department. And it's also a part of the 211 call center that just has two full-time child development specialists answering questions for families about parenting. Could talk about that all day as well. And then I wanted to end by reassuring you that this is all part of the ship. Have you heard about the state health improvement? Yay! So the health department did very strong, collaborative, two and a half year stakeholder engagement work to come up with a set of priorities, not for the health department, for the whole state of Vermont around the health of our citizens. And achieving optimal development is one of the overarching strategies. I brought you the ship today if you want your own hard copy. And with the work that I described around pediatric medical home, Dulce, home visiting, strengthening families are strategies with lots more detail within this ship. So we describe how important it is to screen all kids. We describe how we want Dulce in as the screening brief intervention navigation for the littlest. We believe deeply in home visiting. And then I added this to just show the early care environment, so that the three domains, home, medical home, early care and learning. I didn't address much about early care and learning today. That's a topic for another day. But there is a uh, cross-agency approach right now about building um, the professional development system for understanding the emotional lives of children in child care. So, so that fits in with the fifth of the protective factors of strengthening families. OK, I'm going to end there. I'm going to remind us that we, um, we need to talk about strengths and what's right about families. And 
how we're promoting protective factors in our families. I'm so grateful uh, that you were, invited me today so I could call out my pediatrician colleagues because pediatric health care in Vermont is extraordinary. And One Care really stepped up for us and we're grateful. They are allowing us to pilot three, maybe two, three new Dulce sites in the next year with money in the delivery system reform part of their work and so stay tuned. I don't think I'm allowed to announce publicly where we're heading, but I can whisper to you later <laughs> if uh, my friend Scott Johnson lets me. So I'll stop there. Um, I hope I wasn't too much. Oh, good. Didn't do, yeah. And I'm happy to answer questions or talk later. Questions? I have a question. Um, related to Dulce, I was interested to hear a little bit more about the legal component of the medical legal partnership. Yeah. I do happen to know the attorney who's working in Loyal County, so I know a little bit from her, but I was just interested to hear a little bit more about that involvement. Sure. So um, thanks for calling that out again. Not a ton of time today, but the um, Dulce model was uh, developed and utilized at Boston Medical Center and they very quickly realized they wanted a legal partner in the work in their primary care office with the notion that it's not direct legal services for families, it's consultation about legal issues to the family specialist who works with families. And so when we first heard about this and they came to Lamoille, I think a lot of us thought, oh yeah, Vermont, that's going to be different because Vermont's not a city and we don't have legal issues and it's completely false. The legal issues in Vermont are about health access, your right to um, entitlement programs and state sponsored programs, immigration, uh, employment rights, other, uh, Scott? Housing. Housing, uh, yeah, healthy housing. So we, this has grown to be one of our favorite parts of the model and with the piloting and moving to other parts of the state, the legal um, component is gonna stay right in the center. Thanks for asking about that. Yep. First of all, thank you for coming. I really appreciated your talk, and I have to, I'm gonna publicly also thank you for something else that you don't know that you do. When I, we live in the same town, and we obviously have the same last name. People think that we're always the same person. I don't know if you get that, but I get that all the time. And I will tell you what I get it the most is when I'm calling for reservations at local restaurants, and I say the reservation is Holmes. They say, Dr. Holmes? And I say, absolutely. <laughs> Thinking that I might get a better table. So thank you for being an esteemed member of our uh, community to get me better tables. <laughs> um, so two questions, actually. What do you think, if you had to guess, the percentage of pediatricians currently screening for social determinants? I mean, are we at 100%? Are we at anywhere close to that? It's a great question. So I'm always remiss in a talk that I don't mention the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program. So the last count, there were 100 practices in the state of Vermont that saw children. And there's very interesting data that the littlest are really almost all in pediatrics. Family medicine picks up in the child health arena when kids are about five. So in the 100 practices that see kids, there's a network at VCHIP called CHAMP, Child Health Advances Measured in Practice. 60 practices in that. And last year's project was on food security screening and maternal depression screening. So of those 60 practices, 45 probably participated longitudinally in the quality improvement. So I know for sure 45 practices did food and depression as two of the determinants. So some of the work with One Care that we're having fun with is how are we going to screen, for what, how comprehensively. There's a lot of interesting validation data from Children's Health Watch in Boston that if you ask the two food questions, the hunger vital sign, you can get at about 70% of what families are experiencing in all those other domains, so it might sort of tighten up the, so it's a big topic. I don't know that Vermont has the appetite to standardize this. You know, in my world in systems, I like to just say, here's a screen, everybody do it, but there is an individuation to practices and approaches. I will tell you the Dulce model uses the CMS-10. So Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services came out with the way to screen. Ten, are you familiar with it? Ten questions. So I'm grateful that the Dulce model is using something standardized. So we have all that data and the practices that are going to have Dulce. But in terms of general pediatrics, I think people. So Bright Future stops short of mandating a screen. They don't. They're recommending, not requiring. But they certainly call out all of the standard social questions that we should be asking. I just don't. So and then the next question of who's screening and how is where are they putting that data? Because the only way this is going to matter, that this is going to work for us, is if we 
it's in a central pullable. There, you just tapped my, my knowledge of electronic health record. <laughs> So I, I think we need to make some decisions as a state about how we're going to do this. But VCHIP kind of leads the way in doing it in a non-punitive mandated way. It's through quality improvement, which always works with docs. They like that. Is there a role for Blueprint in that? Yeah. Oh, and I should say, too, the Blueprint in their Women's Health Initiative, which is intimately linked to pediatrics but not kids, you know, they're also using the CMS-10. So we have an alignment, what we're asking in Dulce with Women's Health. And then I think the pediatricians, I know for sure they're asking a few things. I'm just not sure they're asking all 10 things. But do they have to? That's this, I'm sure you hear that a lot. And when we deliver health care, you can't always just add on. So when they added social determinants to Bright Futures, Joe Hagan and some the editors that went out nationally to get will, build will for this, the pediatrician says, OK, so take something out then. <laughs> so it became this terrible, like, what well, am I not going to ask about bike helmets? I mean, there's so many things to talk about in a pediatric health setting, which is why we love Dulce, because it's taking the heat off the dock, and it's saying, Here, here's a family specialist from the parent-child center that's going to fill in all the gaps for the things you wish you knew about this family. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, my second question relates to the expansion. I know that you can't talk about specific communities, but I'm wondering about the timeline of the expansion you know, over time throughout the state you know, for the next five years, how many communities are you hoping will have this model? And, and how do you choose communities? Is it readiness of the community? Is it the need of the community? How are you rolling this out? Yeah, that's exactly where we are right now. I mean, that, so it, there's this sort of state of readiness that we're seeking between, a, so there's the whole notion of a medical home, and now there's a new notion nationally called a high-performing medical home, so it takes the pediatric it's sort of the, you do your bare minimum and then you get really good at this kind of coordination. So we're looking for these high performing um, medical homes at the same time that we have parent child centers that are ready in their structure to really innovate. Hire a full time person and send them over there. So I would say we're very aware of our um, need for geographic diversity and to get this out to the, some of the more rural communities. We're going to talk tomorrow, again we talk every other month to the pediatric subcommittee of One Care with the pediatricians about who's ready, who wants. And, and then honestly, we have a lot of funding streams that we're sort of trying to tap into to bring together a collective budget so we can actually really do this statewide. So we apply for private foundation money. I've got some federal block grant money, which is a maternal and child health seed, but you're not supposed to use it long term. The One Care dollars is provision, you know, it's get going and then someone else should pay. <laughs> And then we also, so we think the health system has a role. And then the last, I, I've actually found a, a crack in CDC opiate fund. You know, the Center for Disease Control likes to give us money for opiate treatment. And we're wondering if this type of screening and getting to know families early and supporting parents could be an opiate prevention strategy. I know it is. I'm just trying to get the funding to flow that way. I'm probably telling you more than I'm supposed to. But it, to me, it's just the the hook or crook thing that we always do in child health, which is just sad. I mean, it's, we, we get it done. It's just not easy. Other questions? Um. <clears throat> Thank you for this. Um, so uh, <clears throat> in Vermont Digger today, they had uh, a recent article about the county rankings coming out. Um, and you can click on state and see rankings within a state. And, um, you know, and, and the primary, the number, of the, the population for primary care physician is one of the rankings by county in Vermont. And so I was looking at, you know, the range here in Vermont, um, in Chittenden County uh, is uh, 550 to 1, and the range at the other end of the spectrum in Essex is uh, 3,090 to 1. Um, and I have a rough a sense can't fully document yet, but kind of just looking at hospital budgets that the, uh, the payer mix by hospitals um, uh, is, you know, in, in Chittenden County, it's, uh, uh, the number here is 59% of their payer mix at, at the, the UVM Medical Center is commercial, whereas up in the Northeast Kingdom, it's 48% uh, and in Springfield, it's 42%. So. Whether there's a cause and effect, I don't know yet, but I'm just wondering, you said that, that access to pediatricians statewide 
uh, they all take um, the Medicaid mm -hmm. patients. And I'm just wondering if, if that is a kind of a blanket statement or are there nuances to that that would be helpful for us to know about? I feel like there are people that know more than I do about this topic, but I, I believe that that is accurate. Uh, unless, is that, Stephanie's nodding. It's because things do change. You know, I'd hate to be, if there one practice to stop doing that. What, what I'm interested in, what you're, so the um, disparity in Medicaid populations in our state for pediatric health care is huge. So the Northeast Kingdom, last I looked, their Medicaid population and their pediatric practice was 70 percent. So we're, but what I love about Vermont, and I don't know if um, this is true of all my colleagues, but it's, we sort of do all of this good work for all the kids. It's not, it's sort of payer agnostic. We don't walk in the, you don't really know who's on Medicaid in a practice. And that might be different now. I haven't been in practice in a few years, but it's the notion that uh, so many kids are covered that it's, it's more than half in our minds. So we, we provide services for all. Does that make sense? So. Yeah, I mean, I think the core of my question, I wandered a little bit, though, is, you know, there are enough pediatricians in places like Essex County yeah. to handle the caseload. So I the workforce piece of this conversation is fascinating. I, I would say we probably need more in the rural communities, but what I, I guess I'll flip it in my strength way and say, we did an evaluation of Dulce and Lamoille Valley of the pediatricians, and she said, I feel better about my job. I know my family's better, and I go home at night with more satisfaction <laughs> because she's physically, I mean, this is now I'm diving into the model, but she's next to the person in the exam room. It's not a call someone down the hall. They do the visit together, and that, I've wondered if that would resonate with people that pediatricians feel better. I hope it does, but that's a little self-serving. But the workforce preservation part of Dulce matters a lot because it's, the growing um, pressure on the pediatric healthcare setting is to address the social complexity, right? Because babies in Vermont are beautiful and healthy. We have the highest, um, I mean, the lowest rate of prematurity, the lowest rate of low birth weight. We, we have really good care, and the babies come out of the earth healthy. But then the social milieu in which they're growing is really challenging, and that needs it to be addressed early in the office. And the other question I had was um, just thinking about insurance plans. And you, you, you made the observation that um, we spend a lot on treatment and not as much as we should on prevention. And I think that's true um, you know, across the playing field. Um, but as, as you go through the development of, of your programs, of your um, uh, benefits that uh, you come across um, that are preventive in nature, that we might uh, adopt in a more formal way within the, say, benchmark plan for QHP plans so that access to those preventive uh, services are um, more readily achievable. Yeah, I mean, I have a little bit of an awkwardness because I work for state government, right? But did I say that at the beginning? Yeah. So sometimes what works best in my world is for me to um, bring expertise and frame and then let others come in with uh, dollar amounts and price tags and stuff only in that, I mean, I, I do share such deep passion for this, but I, ha I think the, and what I really meant to say, and th please don't, I, I, I know people need treatment desperately and it's not, I don't like that sort of Sophie's Choice thing that we're describing. It isn't really that. I just go like this with my hand a lot because it wouldn't take a lot of reframing, it, but it doesn't mean that we don't have desperate treatment needs. It, it's an awkward, I mean, obviously you guys have been grappling this f for a long time. I don't have easy solutions. I just, I look for um, opportunities to remind us how simple it is. It's actually no mystery. Okay, Marie, do you have any questions? No, it's
you're ready, Tom, go ahead. I'm ready if you are. We're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Reese. I'm a resident of South Burlington, a lifelong resident of the state of Vermont. Um, and it's a pleasure to be with you, and I appreciate you sharing time with me. Um, I think it's also important that you see what I brought with me, which is, in fact, the canister that's marketing Brina's program. <laughs> so we're all together in this. Um, I, I'd like to uh, share with you today um, a journey that I've been on and, um, and the resulting uh, education that I've achieved during that journey. Um, I, by training and many years of experience, uh, uh, am a hospital executive healthcare consultant and um, have dedicated my entire career to that. Um, but my career has taken a very different uh, turn over the last several years. And this is the reason for that turn. And I'd like to share with you just briefly the motivation for the change in, in some of the direction in my life. Um, this is Ben. Uh, ben is the big guy in the middle of the picture. And with Ben is his uh, very lovely young lady friend. And those happen to be my three granddaughters with Ben. Um, and Ben uh, is my oldest grandchild. And ben came to live with my wife and I eight years ago, suffering from toxic stress. Um, very complicated situation, um, but uh, originally planned as a, as a hiatus in his family life of uh, eight months to finish his eighth grade school year at South Burlington High School. Um, resulted in, in the discovery that, that Ben was affected by at least five and maybe six ACEs. Um, manifested itself um, in some pretty dysregulated behavior in his family, which extended to uh, us as grandparents as soon as we picked him up in the airport in Boston, having come from his home in, in Harrisburg outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And it's been an amazing journey uh, um, of learning for both he and uh, his grandmother and I. But the journey started with an understanding that we didn't know what was happening with Ben. Had no idea. Um, we were disturbed about his his interactions with us on the way home in the car from Boston, and then became deeply troubled, actually, the first evening that Ben was with us. Um, we had set up a, a bedroom and for him in our home, and um, he proceeded to come into our room, my wife and I room, lay down beside his grandmother, who was Nana, and proceeded to hold her hand the entire night so he could sleep. Um, that actually went on for 30 days until he could sleep in his own room safely and comfortably on his own. Um, fortunately for us and fortunately for Ben, and Ben fortunately for two reasons. One, Ben came to the state of Vermont where the state of Vermont does very special things for its children. And I think you heard from Brina how good we are at caring for our children. And Ben would not be in where he is right now if it were not for the fact that he came to Vermont. There is little question of that. The second very fortunate thing was that my backyard across the, the yard neighbor is Chuck Myers, who is the president of NFI Vermont and a very, very skilled therapist in pediatric behavioral trauma. And uh, he guided us to the first step, saying, you're going to need help. You're going to need lots of help, but we can't tell how much help you're going to need. Why don't you start with, with First Call, which is a, a program of uh, family support uh, from the Howard Center in Burlington. 
within 30 days, we had progressed through that system to uh, the belief that Ben and Nana and I needed to enter into family therapy to support this child's needs into the future. Um, and we uh, happened to have, as a therapist, David Melnick from NFI, who is certainly a, a godsend to all of us. Um, ben proceeded, uh, when it came time for Ben to go back to Charlotte, um, David said, there's no way this child is going back to that environment. It's not going to be successful for him. It's not going to be successful for his family. And so Ben stayed with us. Um, we got him through high school, barely. Um, as bright as he is and as full of personality as he is, we got him through high school with enormous support and support extending even when he was in high school, extending to, to on the phone support with NFI staff when we were on vacation in Maryland. Um, he needed a year between uh, high school and his next step. Um, fortunate enough to go to a, uh, a school in Maine called Bridgeton Academy that that enabled his growth to continue. And at the end of uh, that in-between year, he was uh, accepted as a student at the University of Maine in Orono, um, where he originally wanted to become, he thought he wanted to become an athletic trainer. And, um, and within a month, made the decision that he, as a employee of the South Burlington Rec Department and Rec Camp during summers, had had four young men that were in his camp that he took a great affection for and really appreciated, they appreciated him. And he um, said that in view of the fact that he could really help them and wanted to continue to help children in that circumstance, uh, decided to change his major and become a social work major. And Ben is now a mid-junior year major in social work, is, um, and I say this with a lot of pride in him, he is a really big force on the University of Maine campus. Um, and in fact is uh, going to be the director of the, the on-campus director of student intramural athletics next year for the entire campus. It's a great success story and what has driven me is <clears throat> letting every child in the state of Vermont that is suffering from toxic stress have that ability and the resources available to them to make that same transition. We can heal these brains, and, and he is 95% healed. Um, so along with the way on this journey, um, I volunteered as, uh, to become a board member at um, NFI, and had no understanding of what was going on with this young man, and then suddenly started to learn What's going? What was going on with him? And and Rena has mentioned the brain science that that we have all come to discover that leads us to to the understanding that as long as we uh, diagnose toxic stress and start working with individuals suffering from toxic stress, we can heal these brains until they're age 24, 25, or 26. We know that's capable, and, and so, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide just to bring it to, to your attention. Um, but the results of toxic stress are pretty profound. And um, this is part of my educational journey and the part that I want to share with you. Um, so if a child has three or four, and in, in Ben's case, is five or six ACEs, we could, we could look at behavior that's going to be risky for him, which is lack of physical activity, smoking, alcoholism, drug use, and, and um, staying at home, not going to school, not going to work. 
but the long-term effects are all the effects that you're dealing with from a healthcare system's perspective, and that is going to continue to be extremely costly for us. How many children are affected? And I hope that you've seen this, but I'll go through it briefly. Right now, there are, in the last count, there are 15,800 children in this state who are affected with three or more ACEs. And there are probably more than that because, as Brina said, ACEs don't take into account homelessness. They don't take into account poverty, um, some of the social determinants that are additional to these that we know. Um, but you can see the array of, the, of the, the major ones here being divorced and separated patient, parents, family income, hardship, and substance abuse issues. Um, there's a subset of that of children under six, and so we have 3,000 children under six who are living with toxic stress that, that are, are going to be demanding resources from us. The magnitude of the problem is I began to, to sort it out in my own mind as a, as a healthcare professional um, became obvious when I started talking with some of those that I'm close to in other areas of, of uh, interest, education, um, and, and spent time with Melissa Bailey as the Commissioner of, uh, of Mental Health Services. Um, Con Hogan, who was a, a dear friend and advisor, Charlie Smith, who was also Secretary of the AHS as an advisor. We started to try to unscramble what this impact on all of us was really like. So this is a graph of the expenditures for the Department of Mental Health directly related to children with ACEs. This is Melissa Bailey's graph. Um, which shows the, the slope of that graph beginning to change in 2011 and accelerate um, on, a, on a something like 10% per year basis. Similarly, this is from my dear friend and colleague David Young at the South Burlington School System. Um, I will share with you that, that my first conversations with David were back here in 2015 when he said, this is problematic for me at $9 million a year. I am struggling with that amount of budget, money dedicated to my budget. And um, it's, a, it's a challenge to me. This is 2017 and 2019 that number is now budgeted well over $11 million for David. And David is saying, this is no longer a problem. This is out of control, and I can't continue to manage it. So this is the richest school system in the state of Vermont that is saying, whose, whose CEO is very, very skilled and attuned to these, who's saying, I can't manage this anymore in my school system. And that's, that's, that goes across the system for all of us. So here's, here's the high point of my learning from uh, the challenge that we face. Toxic stress represents the most vexing, ubiquitous public health crisis we have ever faced. I will add to that that, that we right now believe we face a huge public health crisis, which we do in opioid use. But those who studied, study addictive behavior and, and numbers coming out of the University of Tennessee Health Science Center and their directive of, of, of addictive behavior says that 84% of those people with opioid or other types of substance abuse addiction, addiction have in fact three plus ACEs so that while the opioid addiction is certainly a public health crisis, we are in fact uh, need to take on the root cause of that crisis, which is toxic stress and adverse childhood events. So we skip the, the second line, we know that already. 
<coughs> those numbers of children mean that one out of every five children in our school system are suffering from toxic stress, which means that <coughs> each classroom of 20 students has potentially five children who at any one point of time are going to exhibit dysregulated behavior and cause disruption in that classroom. Um, and out of the $411 million we spent on, on care for children suffering from toxic stress in 2017, um, 12,000 or 46% of that was spent on education and in the educational system. The long-term impacts on Vermont of toxic stress Healthcare impact is $363 million. We believe that there were almost 80,000 visits in emergency rooms last year, resulting in $120 million, $26 million of expense there. And here we sit, and Brina say, was saying how seminal this piece of academic study was, and we're 20 years later, and there has not been any in the, where in the country a systemic uh, uh, approach to addressing this problem. And it's, it's covering all of the states within the country, and it's not a problem that is, is unique to the United States. Um, here is the best I have been able to put together as a cost of, of ACEs in the state of Vermont. Some of these are, are computed costs based on uh, actual numbers within our budget. And then there are national estimates that are based on the, the ACES studies. Um, so, so I know pretty closely that we spent the $411 million in 2017. The numbers would indicate there's another $136 million in criminal justice, long-term health care. Um, and then there's a whole other bucket called um, loss of productivity caused by ACEs affecting people's lives. So that the best guess from the ACEs study is that the impact of ACEs on the state of Vermont is something in excess of $2 billion a year. What do we do about that? And so, so beginning from this slide, which is now 18 years old, no, 13 years old. This is Khan's slide. Um, this was Khan's plea as to how we sh can get ourselves reorganized to take on toxic stress. So he said, we've got to get out of our silos. We've got to broaden our thinking. We've got to do things differently than we have been doing things. We've got to have data. We've got to have indicators of outcomes. And we've got to understand what we're doing and what effect we're having. And we've got to go to a, a, a prevention-oriented approach. Um, this is just a graphic presentation of my learning. This is not comprehensive learning at all. This is a, a graphic presentation of 21 programmatic initiatives that have, have either been implemented in the state of Vermont or have been uh, studied. And you'll see Dolce is up here. Um, there are other nurse home visiting models there. But the, the message is that we have lots of activity going on in this space. There are a lot of people trying to make things better. I won't go over this. It's, 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 it's Heckman's graph, and the graph is pretty simple. We need to invest way upstream in our dollars. It's not going to be effective to invest in dollars out here if we're going to counter these problems. So, uh, so as my journey unfolded, I said, so what do I know that I can apply and help with this? Well, one of the things that I learned uh, fairly early on in, in his journey um, in working with Don Berwick from IHI was that the, the, his triple aim, which is improving the health of a population 
enhancing the experience of care and reducing per capita costs are the keys to solving our healthcare crisis. Um, without that, we don't have an affordable system and we are going to continue to struggle. So, so packaging that, I said, so a foundational programmatic approach would indicate that we're going to have to try to integrate our systems in a different way. Our health system, our behavioral health system, our educational system, our human services, and our criminal justice system. Those really were driven by conversations I had with state leaders in all of those areas, whether it be education um, and David Young, or whether it be criminal justice in conversations with T.J. Donovan. Um, it appeared that we needed to have a proactive, a systematic way to integrate those services. Um, that led to my belief that we could, in fact, um, construct a, a discovery project unique to the state of Vermont based on state of Vermont learning, values, and experiences ranging from all that the legislature has done to move the needle on health care provision to all that the Brina has, and the health department have done in home visiting um, and all that we have aspirations for doing in integrating behavioral health and primary health, that it would be possible to actually conduct a controlled trial study of uh, a, what a new system of care and services for the state of Vermont might look like. <coughs> Part of that belief is built on this particular slide, which actually was crafted by the Agents of Human Services back in 2017, where they wanted to work from across this continuum, continuum from a network to an integration perspective. And in many services, they are now out here with some really, really tight collaboration, and specifically that collaboration in integrated family services in both Addison and Franklin counties have been very, very successful. The aspiration is to get those integrated, but certainly they are they're very, very collaborative. And the second very, very poignant um, uh, piece is the, the collaboration between interagencies that is, uh, that is reflected in this program, which is in fact collaboration between the health department and the Agency of Human Services. But the entire focus has been to create a, a respectful model of care for, for those that we're trying to serve. Um, so along my, my journey, and let me see how we're doing for time. Along my journey, um, I was reconnected with Ken Epstein. Um, Ken was uh, the CEO of NFI Vermont, an early pioneer in childhood trauma back in the, in the mid 80s prior to the uh, discovery of and quantification of ACEs. Um, Kim, uh, Ken was working um, with a group from San Fran of his peers from San Francisco on trying to understand more about what was happening with children. Um, Ken and I have worked together to try to figure out what a, a research project might look like. And this is Ken's experienced PhD wisdom from the University of California, San Francisco, where he has been a faculty member for a number of years. And, and his belief is what, what would be most beneficial is a public-private partnership that we're proposing to try to do, which would codify a blending funding structure for children and families. Um, that are consistent with their core values of, uh, and these are SAMHSA core values relative to behavioral health services. That would be, uh, rest in a single continuum of care organization, a unified organization. And here's a, a really important key 
that organization would be in a position of taking joint funding accountability. So that in essence, this is saying that the research study would study an integrated continuum of care that is a sub-provider under an ACO arrangement. This would be a, a, a continuum of care that could take a capitated amount from a, an ACO and move that down to the community level. And the, the entire reason for doing this would be to re redirect special education, mental health, and child welfare, criminal justice services, and in our belief, those need to be moved up hill, upstream into both home visiting, early childhood education and care, and, and home care. The continuum would, ha continue would have these attributes. Views would be defined collectively by the participants. It would be proactive, countywide, in inclusive of everybody up to age 25 because we are able to heal brains up to that age. It's got to be trauma-driven, uh, data-driven, because we under, got, need to understand what we're doing, both clinically and financially, so that we know what the benefits are that are working and those that are not. Certainly trauma-informed, um, you know, highly functional. And in my belief, it should, should be in four cohort clusters, the pre-birth to 0, 0 to 3, 4 to 17, and 18 to 25, all of which have different characteristics. So we saw this slide. This is what we look like at the present time. This is what I think we could look like. And we could like, look like a system of care and services that are integrated, that have clean handoffs between very defined sectors of, of providers and that are in one way or another uh, on their way to definition by themselves. This one here you heard today is pretty, is pretty robust and, and certainly growing more robust. Um, and it is a key, key component because it is the early stopper of childhood toxic stress. Um, and so the, the, the more we can get into this system of care, the more we can, can take that 16,000 young people and narrow that down in numbers. Um, we're all working hard here, zero to three, zero to four. We're all working hard on the, on the five-star ch child care system. My belief is it needs to be on steroids. It needs to have a uh, very, very robust um, Dolce-like, integrated-like support services in that five-star model so that children can move from home to home care to daycare that's going to give them the same uh, support structure that they have had in their, in their uh, home care visiting. And then we're going to need to look at this educational system and figure out how we're going to balance the social service structural support needs versus the educational needs in a very thoughtful and different way than we're doing it right now. We cannot just move dysregulated children into our school system and expect the school system to going to fix it. It's not going to happen. And then out here, we have a whole group that as, as I've served on the NFI board, and have, uh, have come to understand more fully, we have a whole group of those who are 18 to 25 who are suffering from toxic stress, whose brains are not healed, who we don't provide any services to. And out here, at that age group, we have those who are forming new families, those who are marrying, those who are bringing children into the world, and, and it's a prime time, prime space for intergenerational toxic stress and ACEs. So that's a proposal that's floating around, and it's floating around in Addison County, it's floating around within the legislature, it's actually floating around within AHS, and we'll see where that goes. I, I bring it to you specifically 
as we're looking to accomplish this, it is a systemic approach. Um, we, excuse me, we need to we need to look at how we're going to integrate all these services out here in one system of care that we can finance outside of the outside of our own resources, um, and we can do that because of Ken. Epstein's presence as a major force of trauma throughout the country, uh, who has direct contacts with several of these entities, most, by, most importantly Robert Wood Johnson, the Harris um, Foundations, and SAMHSA. Um, and so the project that we're proposing would be uh, directed by the, the board of RTP, which is uh, organization that has been uh, is a nonprofit organization we formed back two years ago to to in fact hold some of this effort it was formed by David Young um, Charlie Smith uh, Chuck Myers and John Sales and myself um, we would propose the study be conducted uh, by Ken Epstein and and myself as co-principal investigators Supported by data from the FTI Center for Economic Policies, uh, Econo Center for Healthcare Economics and Policy, and that we would use presently existing data streams out of the data system that the that is shared between the Department of uh, Mental Health and the Department of DCF. Objectives would be pretty clear. Measured improvement in the health of the Addison County residents, measured improvement in the satisfaction of families and and their interface with the services, and we need to bring back to everybody, most importantly to you, and to the legislature and to AHS, a measured and quantified impact statement of what can be accomplished with the various component pieces of change that are currently in play when they're packaged together. We know there's a rate of return to be gained from Dolce home visiting. We know that's somewhere in the neighborhood of five to eight or nine percent. We know that there's a rate of return to be generated from, from five-star child care, and that's probably from five to 13 percent, 13 percent being a Heckman, Heckman number of the top end, but that was in a very different environment. So probably five or six percent. We don't know what the, 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 the rate of return is to be generated from applying those across the continuum of care. And until we have that number, then, then the legislature and administration can't safely say we ought to invest substantial amounts of dump dollars in changing our social support structures until we can define what the rate of return is going to be on those dollars. And this is, this is your charge relative to ACO development and ACES. Um, it is a big, it's a big responsibility for you to understand the dynamics of this extremely expensive and, and pressing problem, expensive not only from the perspective of finances, but from the perspective of its impact on our children and, and families. That's my journey. Thank you for share, allowing me to share it with you. Thank you, Tom. Any questions for Tom from the board? Maureen, do you have a question? So this yeah, point, about that. Thank you.
you go. So Michelle, whenever you're ready, you okay. can tee up the uh, primary care. Yeah, of course. Uh, so Michelle Degree, Health Policy Advisor with the board. Um, I'm just going to provide a brief introduction uh, to those of you here uh, and the next set of presenters for today's meeting. Um, as you'll recall, Section 10 of Act 113 of the Acts of 2016 established the Primary Care Advisory Group with the intent to provide input and recommendations to the board. The language um, at the time specified three topics related to administrative burden and required the Green Mountain Care Board to provide an update on the work of the PCAG in our annual report. Um, despite our best efforts, there was no action taken uh, to uh, amend the statutory language, so the PCAG officially sunset on June 30th of 2018. Um, Given the general interest of the board to have primary care provider opinions and perspectives, um, we used um, existing authority to create uh, to renew the PCAG um, outside of those statutory requirements. Uh, each member of the group that started in 2016 through 2018 was urged to reapply, um, and we did work with external partners to expand the reach of those applicants, including the Medical Society and by state. Um, the, um, in the review of applicants, we did make sure to pay special attention to ensure the group had representation from various categories and types of practitioners, practice venues, and geographic locations. And I'm pleased to say we did a pretty good job. <laughs> there are 13 providers who meet bi-monthly, and our fourth meeting of this newly formed group um, occurs this evening. So they're here to uh, kind of talk about and highlight opportunities for improving access to primary care from their perspective. Um, another piece of their charter is to work with the board on areas of interest. Um, and so with that said, we often do have uh, a board member in attendance at the primary care advisory group meetings to sort of work through those um, topics with the providers. Are there any questions? I didn't think so. Robin will be tonight, yes. yes, Robin will be there tonight. We always have a board member in attendance, <laughs> and we always have the executive director in attendance. So I just wanted to clarify. And there's always a staff member in attendance. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so with that, I'm going to bring up the three providers we have here today, and I'll let them introduce themselves, and I will step away. Thank you very much, of course. Michelle, for all your work on this. I guess we should introduce ourselves first and then go into our presentation. Uh, my name is Tim Tanner. I'm an internal medicine pediatrics practitioner working at the Danville Health Center, it's one of the QACs attached with Northern County Health Care. I've been here since 1993. I also do part-time work as a hospitalist at MBRH. I'm Vivo Presby, and despite what the agenda says, I no longer work at Gifford Healthcare. Um, I left there in January, and we'll be starting with an FQHC actually located in North Adams, Massachusetts, but still serving Greensboro, Stanford, and other parts of Vermont. Um, and I'm going to continue to live in Vermont and be insured in Vermont, so I still care what we do. I'm Faye Homan. I'm a family practitioner in Wells River, Vermont. I've been there since 1993 also. Um, a broad scope of family medicine and some inpatient care at Cottage Hospital, which is in Woodsville, New Hampshire, as well. So we were given the opportunity to come and present our concerns and appreciate the time that you're allowing us and also to hopefully answer any questions you might have about anything primary care related. And the sort of desperate topics that we're going to be bringing up and I've been elected to go first. You just speak a little bit louder. Yeah, sorry. Like, that'd be helpful. Thank you. So my topic is on documentation hassles, if you will, that primary care providers face and how that impacts access and burnout. And I'm hoping to sort of give a little bit of a brief history, hope you'll bear with me with that, and maybe throw out a few bizarre ideas as to solutions and maybe something that actually the Green Mountain Care Board could act on. And I have one slide that I'll ask if someone could project it, not yet. I don't know where those are. It was on the agenda. Is that possible? Which document was it? It was E&M. Yes. Audit form. Yeah. But not yet, please. 
Um, it'll take a few minutes, so okay. I'll just yeah. get ready. So there's been a lot of talk about high value care in the medical field. Less talk about high value documentation. And the value part depends on your perspective of who's looking at the documents. So once upon a time in medical history, not as long ago as the Brothers Grimm, but not that long ago, um, medical records were a mess. It just was something you scribbled on at the bedside and it was hard to follow. And then Dr. Larry Lee in the 1960s sort of developed a system that's kind of standard now, so-called soap note. And that's been sort of carried forward. And originally, documentation was principally for clinicians to be able to remember what they were talking about, the next person coming along to try to figure out what's the story, where do we go from here. Then came in some requirements for the medical legal aspect. If it wasn't documented, you didn't do it, so that maybe improved things a little bit. And then the demands on documentation for providers became billing. Um, and that really has where we've been for the last 25 plus years of documenting to the bill. And if you could now project that. <laughs> Is that Mostly you're on the, the 1200 step. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 12,000. 12, 12, 12, it was up there. So this is a, an example of the uh, billing audit form that our organization uses. And I just projected for the emotional impact uh, because it's kind of a Chinese menu of things that you're supposed to document in order to justify billing an office visit at a certain level for reimbursement. And the result of this sort of is notes that have lots of verbiage that really don't have a lot of meaning to the clinician. The electronic, the introduction of the electronic health record made templated notes and clicking boxes the ability to, to do billing better, but made these end up with these Frankenstein notes that grammatically don't flow, that have information pulled in in order to satisfy a billing requirement. And then added onto the billing thing more recently has been the, you know, the expectation that primary care providers provide documentation for population management, for quality, and for research with you know, defining ICD-10 codes and things like that. So if you add all these things up, the clinical need, the need for medical legal coverage, the billing, which is the major driver probably, and then the population stuff, this all takes time. And that's time away from patients. It's time more in front of the screen. Um, it's less access. For, if you're an employed physician, as I am, it may be less time for patients. If you are a self-employed physician, it leads to burnout because you you're doing charting you know, well into the night on weekends. So that's sort of the frustration part. And then so, so where do we go from here? And this is sort of the ideas, if you will, that probably a little bit out there, but you know, in a galaxy far, far away, if you could jump forward, I would like to see the day where the patient comes in and puts their smartphone down on the desk, and that's recording and through the combination of artificial intelligence, some editing that, that the provider does, and analyzing the metadata, the stuff that's going on that shows where we've been, perhaps the note could be, all the documentation would be done through that. Um, the medical information is the patient's. Ultimately, it should be residing. They're the ones that contain it. More realistically, I was hoping that with the all-payer model, perhaps there could be a waiver so that we don't need to document all this stuff in order to get um, reimbursed. CMS is actually now starting to move that way. They're proposing in 2021 to change the billing requirements and drop the history and physical parts of documentation and just bill based on problem, complexity, number, and time. And I've seen some of the templates and they don't look any better than this one really in terms of what's required. But from the standpoint of the Green Mountain Care Board, if it's at least when you're reviewing budgets for the ACO or hospitals to raise your concern about what are you doing to try to decrease some of the clicks, counts, the uh, documentation that may not be directly clinically relevant um, when you're reviewing budgets to, you know, to sort of decrease provider burnout. And that's all I have. And that's a great segue into me, who was assigned to talk about burnout in detail. 
um, because that's a big concern. Um, one of your priorities for this year listed in your 2018 report is healthcare workforce, and this greatly impacts the healthcare workforce. Um, I had to work with that segue first, but again, I want to thank you for inviting us and listening to us and um, by having a board member and the executive director attend all our meetings taking this seriously. So one of the big concerns in the medical literature has been burnout among providers, and I had two slides or two uh, things. I don't know how that, whether they got entered or, or whether you would just handed them. There's a table and a, and a um, figure. Um, and the table shows um, over we have five. Of it. What? Oh. We do have Okay, the table shows over five year periods um, in the medical literature the growth of articles on burnout um, and of special interest of course to me in primary care is that those number, the number of articles in five year periods um, increased by 20 times in the last 25 years. Um, so they, yeah, that's table one, there's, there's the article. So I just picked a well respected journal, the New England Journal of Medicine. And the bottom thing, the figure, is the graph of how many um, articles they had on burnout um, each year in the New England Journal. And you can see that from 2016 to 2018, it has just exploded. Um, most of these articles, when I reviewed them, um, used something called a MASLAC inventory. So there are well-validated measures to measure burnout, if you will, in healthcare providers. I'm going to qualify that in a second. Um, the Maslach inventory covers three areas, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and personal accomplishment. High scores in the former two, the emotional exhaustion and depersonalization, um, contribute to a potential conclusion of burnout, and low scores in personal accomplishment do the same. So you have to have high scores in two of them and low scores in the third. Unfortunately, however, despite the number of articles, there is no agreed upon definition about what burnout is, so that's up to the author um, or authors of the article. But if you give them that freedom, they say that the number of um, providers that are experiencing burnout symptoms is between 20 and 40 percent. And when they look at this with regard to other aspects, uh, the burned out physicians and pr other providers are associated with higher turnover and occasionally in some articles with worse patient outcomes. Neither one of those is a good thing for the state of Vermont. Um, incidence of burnout in these studies is higher in female physicians. I haven't seen an article about whether it's higher in female providers in general, just in female physicians, so I have to say, say it that way. Um, but that's an increasing segment of our physician population. I can tell you, I'm an old guy, okay? Um, my class at UVM Medical School had, was 14% female. I believe they've been over 50% for several years, and nationally we are over 50% female in medical school classes. So as these people, if you will, grow up and go out into the world, if burnout is higher in them, we're gonna have an increasing problem um, to deal with. So I have some theories um, about this. Um, one of them is, lo and behold, H electronic health records um, and the stuff that came with them, including the High Tech Act and meaningful use, the documenting for quality and um, that um, Jim mentioned. So the use of uh, EHR is nearly quadrupled from 20.8% to 78.4 percent between 2004 and 2013. Um, now the growth in the articles itself was pretty steady um, through most of those um, periods of time, but that's just one of the factors. Another one that concerns me is an increase in the amount, in the number of administrators. Now I worked very hard to find the raw data for this chart, but and I couldn't. I, find it so I didn't put it in the stuff you were given because I didn't think I could say that it was absolutely reliable. But I have seen the chart in four or five different sources. Um, it's almost always the same chart that shows that physicians 
grew about 150%, which was the rate of population growth, pretty much matches the rate of population growth over the period of time from 1975 to 2010. During that time, the number of health administrators and how that was characterized in the study, which is why I was looking for the base da data and, and couldn't find it, um, supposedly grew 3,200%. In other words, it's 32 times more administrators in 2010 than there were in 1975. Um, the problem with that from a primary care perspective is that each administrator requires more, requires us to work to support them because we're the people who bring the money into the organization. Um, we and obviously the other providers um, do that. So we have to do more work um, to support them. At the same time, we're trading that for decreased control over our life. And again, we don't think that's a good thing. The, Third theory that I have is the rise in hospitalist care. Um, this may only be applicable to primary care, um, but in the 10 year period from 2004 to 2013, that same time period that I was talking about, the EHR, the number of hospitalists in the United States tripled from 14,000 to 42,000. Um, I gave up doing hospital care, um, unlike my colleagues here, in 2010. Um, because I was going to a practice that didn't do it and um, thought that was a great thing because sometimes working in the hospital is, happens at inconvenient times and all kinds of things. But I have found that no longer doing hospital care um, has led to less contact with patients at high stress times, which impacts my feeling of whether I'm providing them really true continuity of care. Um, and I think that it also decreases the amount of trust that they have in me because if I can deal with their worst problems, then I can deal with their more minor problems in the office um, as well in their minds. Um, it also leads to more constricted areas of practice and um, I think less challenge in my practice that obviously the people in the hospital are sicker than the people in my office. And that, that challenge, an intellectual challenge of dealing with those things is lost when you stop doing hospital care. Um, it also leads to less interaction with specialists and with other primary care colleagues um, who we used to see and passing in the hospital, say hello, how you doing, all of that kind of stuff. We never see them anymore. Um, and that leads to more isolation. So I think that those things all contribute to the feelings of burnout. Um, I don't have solutions for them, unfortunately. Um, but I want to, uh, I, I did not know this, I didn't look at Tim's display, but if we could put that back up there. Um, I'd like to close with words written by Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America, which has nothing to do with medicine. Um, but he wrote um, that we will be smothered with a network of small, complicated rules, minute and uniform, through which the most original minds and the most energetic characters cannot penetrate to rise above the crowd. The will of man is not shattered, but softened, bent, and guided. Men are sel seldom forced by it to act, but they are constantly constrained from acting. Such a power does not destroy, but it prevents existence. It does not tyrannize, but it compresses, enervates, extinguishes, and stupefies the people. That's burnout in my mind. Well, I'm not going to top that, I don't think. <laughs> I actually um, scribbled a couple little things in my margins while Tim and Lee were talking. and. Um, just a few numbers and thoughts to support what they said. Um, there's a paper that says that for an average patient to get through a primary care visit, it takes 233 clicks in the computer. Um, so decreasing that clicking would go a long ways to decreasing burnout. 
And in terms of this insane documentation that we do, um, the, com the, the electronic health record's response to it is to produce all these templated notes, notes that have all the yes and no answers already put in them, notes that have these 29-point review of systems already answered. And the idea is that the provider's supposed to go in and take out the ones that they didn't ask the patient. And what really ends up happening, or take out the parts of the physical exam that they didn't perform on the patient, and what really ends up happening is that there's a lot of documentation of stuff that didn't happen just by human nature because you don't go in and revise line by line your notes. So um, that, um, the complexity is actually in, in, a, in, in a perverse way sort of making there be um, um, doc inaccurate documentation. To Lee's point um, about burnout, I was at a talk uh, within the last year where they said that to recruit a new physician, the cost is often about three hundred thousand dollars. So burnout is a burnout is a money issue or is a cost to the system issue as well. Um, and documentation is a huge cost to the system. And I'll just mention that at, at the federally qualified health center where I work. If you count our employees who, ha who are there because of the electronic health records, so our IT team who keep the nuts and bolts working, the informatics team that um, makes the templates, collects the reports, crunches the data, and then our medical scribes, so we actually have people who, come, who, who, who do our documentation for us. If you count all of those IT-related people, we have um, six IT positions for seven provider positions. That's insane. There is no way that that expense is reflected in improving quality. So now I'll do what I'm, now I'll talk about what I intended to talk about, which is strengthening primary care in Vermont. Um, I, I think you may have an outline, but don't look at it because I'm going to jettison it completely. When I was, it, it's really just for reference because there's some thoughts on there that you may want to look at. But when I was um, putting together my thoughts on this talk, I realized that my outline for this talk was exactly the same as an outline for a talk I did in December of 2017 and also one that I presented to you in 2018. And so um, I thought you probably didn't need to hear me rant further about quality measures and the electronic health record. But really, I just want to talk about PCAG, which is, you know, in this new iteration, there were a number of people that didn't sign back up. And several of them um, told me that the reason they weren't interested in continuing was sort of this feeling that although we have a lot of ideas, a lot of thoughts, and some great conversations that happen, that in terms of really visible outcomes, there hasn't been a lot. We, we don't feel like we've really changed things very much. And so if there's one thing that I could say about the 2.0 version of PCAG, it's that we want to look for ways that all these disparate organizations, institutions, um, can really work together for implementation of some of these changes. There's really no argument, I don't think, anymore about the centrality of strong primary care to increasing uh, access to care, increasing quality of care, and decreasing cost. That's, um, that's been really uh, well proven, but it, it feels like there isn't uh, much of a sense of urgency about making, making those changes. And those changes require institutional change and cultural change, which are not, not fast. But in terms of that sense of urgency, there's one paper from the Annals of Family Medicine that I like to, that, that has just stuck in my head. It says if cost trends continue at, at current rates, that by 2033, which isn't very far away, certainly in policy terms, not far away at all, by 2033, the cost of a family health care premium will equal the median family income. So, Knowing, as we do, that building a system that has primary care central to it will increase access and quality and decrease cost seems that it seems to be really maybe the most important uh, goal we could have. There's really nobody else who's offering improved quality access and decreased cost. There's no other proposals that get there. Um, one of the things that has been shown to move the needle a little on establishing a strong primary care base is um, this uh, increase in primary care spend rate that was undertaken in Rhode Island. And I, I know that all of you know about this. And I'll just quickly recap for anyone in the audience. 
who might not be aware, but out of a out of a hundred out of one healthcare dollar, currently about five to nine cents is spent in primary care. In um, Rhode Island, when they increased that number of cents from five to eight, they decreased 18 percent the total cost of health care in the state. So it was a really effective way um, of getting towards our goal. There are a couple of bills in the legislature, I guess one now at this point, um, S-53, that begins to sort of get at that primary care spend rate and how to increase it. There are probably a lot of ways to go about it. In Rhode Island, they did it by legislating that the insurance companies had to figure out how to do it, but I'm sure there's many other ways, and this is what I'm talking about when I say that PCAG would like to figure out how to work together with other institutions, because I think we could brainstorm some, some real ideas there. And, you know, people think I'm kidding when I say that there's only two important quality measures, and I really am not kidding. I mean it absolutely. There really are only two quality measures that matter, and they are not in the electronic health record. They're population questions. Do you have a primary care provider, and have you seen them in the last year? That's how we move the needle on this, and so anything we can do to build that system um, really should be a priority. There's one little ticket item that we talked about in PCAG, and that, that I think we should find a way to make a reality, and that's the Vermont Common Drug Formulary. That would be a document, wouldn't have to be cast in stone, wouldn't have to be 100% accurate, but a document that if you chose a med from that document when you were with a patient, the high likelihood would be that it would be a tier one drug for your patient that you were sitting with that day. A document like that has sort of existed in the past. Someone from Blue Cross brought us or told us about a project that a pharmacy intern had done with them that kind of got at establishing that kind of a document. On PCAG, in terms of implementation and action, we would really love to know how can we make that a reality. Would the insurers take it on? Would our new pharmacy school in Burlington take it on? How can we make that a reality? In terms of decreasing uh, the amount of clicks and the amount of time and administrative time that we spend in our office and that pharmacists spend on their end, um, that would be a, a really, I think, achievable and low ticket goal. I'm going to tell two little stories about um, one of, one of my uh, items on the list being developing an electronic health record that really works for documentation and communication, not just for billing. And, um, so in the current world, <clears throat> I've ranted before, and I won't, won't belabor it, about the discharge summaries that I get from, we'll say, Hospital A, where most of my patients go. Um, they're really long. My record length one is 42 pages, but very frequently the discharge summaries are 20 to 30 pages long. It's enormously time consuming to wade through and see what was important and what I need to pay attention to. I had my, one of our IT people reach out to Hospital A to um, see what we could do to get more useful documentation. And the reply she got was, um, we can't control what our doctors put in their discharge summaries. That's the world we're living in right now. If we had a system where primary care was really seen as the central organization or the central thing on which healthcare was, was organized, um, I would hope for a different answer. And, and to illustrate that, I'll say that um, a couple weeks ago, my father-in-law was hospitalized at Hospital B in Vermont. And uh, I was given his discharge summary. And it's important to note that these two hospitals use the same electronic health record. I was given a copy of my father-in-law's discharge summary, and it was three pages long. It had everything anyone needed in it, the five diagnoses he had been treated for, what was tested for, what the results were, and what the primary care doc should follow up on as an outpatient. It was the most concise, useful document I have seen since the days when we dictated letters to each other. So if we really had a system that believed that primary care was central, my IT person would call IT person at Hospital A, and that person would say, that's fascinating. Let me go see what they're doing at Hospital B and see what we can do to improve the quality of our communication. So that gets me down to workforce, which if we're going to strengthen primary care, obviously we need a whole lot more of us. And um, on PCAG, we've talked about a lot of ideas about that. One of them 
is really this concept of narrowing the salary gap between specialists and primary care. I'm not talking about upending our system and paying family docs and cardiothoracic surgeons the same. I'm really just talking about a little nudge in the system so that our students who come out of medical school have an option of choosing primary care. My illustrative story is of a, a woman I know who uh, left a dermatology res uh, fellowship recently, well, about three years ago, I guess. She was offered a job with a $150,000 signing bonus and a $1.2 million salary, not in Vermont, but not in that different of a state, honestly. Her signing bonus is more than any primary care provider in my organization, even the medical director, makes per year. So again, not asking for more money from the system as a whole, just a little nudge to bring those things closer together. There are a lot of ideas in PCAG about improving our workforce, improving the number of people who are trained in Vermont. Last week was Match Day at UVM, and Match Day is this really heady day in your fourth year of med school, and everyone gets in the same room, and you all open your envelopes, and you find out where you're going to be for residency, and uh, um, you know for the next three or eight years, depending on what you're specializing in. When you look at the data from UVM last um, last week and you make some corrections for the percent, so the, the three um, specialties that are most likely to go into primary care would be family medicine, pediatrics, and internal medicine. You have to apply a little correction to that because in peds, only about 44% stay in primary care. In internal medicine, it's way lower, only 14% stay in primary care, most specialized. And in family medicine, that's about 91%. So if you apply that correction to the match day results from last week at UVM, 16% of their graduates from this year are going into primary care. That's a really tiny number. There are programs across the country, innovative programs, some waive tuition for people who commit to uh, 10 years of primary care. Some look at, um, identify students as young as high school that have an interest in medicine and primary care. They uh, shepherd them through summer programs. They establish job shadow opportunities for them as young as high school in their own communities. Have them go back to that job shadow when they're medical students and when they're residents. Those programs are working. Alabama has figured out how to get their own residents to provide care in their rural communities. How do we move towards innovative programs like that? Not just in the medical school training, but the same thing could be applied to nurse practitioner training in Vermont. And we could look at our residency training as well. We make six, we graduate six family medicine residents per year in the state. That's the same number as we graduate in ear, nose, and throat surgery and in anesthesia. There are ways to move the needle on that. PCAG has a lot of people who are uh, enthusiastic, energetic, even idealistic, a few of them. Uh, we would love to talk about ways that all of these organizations, because it will take small hospitals, big hospitals, insurers, state agencies, It'll take all kinds of institutions to change uh, a little bit with approach and culture to get there. And so I'll wrap up and hope that we have a little time to talk about that um, now. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the board? Robin. Thank you for being here. Um, as the board member who used to come regularly under the previous version of PCAG, most of you are, are very familiar to me, and I appreciate all of your volunteerism that you have provided for the board. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to mention um, in the conversation. One is about the, the, for the folks who didn't continue after the Act 113 version of the group, group I'm sympathetic to um, the frustrations around the charge of that group in Act 113 and, and really what the board is able to act on. Because I think that those three items that the PCAG was charged with were really, for the most part, not within the board's authority. <laughs> so there was kind of a mismatch. In some ways, I think we were chosen really to facilitate the group and provide the legislative report, and that was maybe not clear. So I'm hoping that 
with the reconstituted uh, PCAG, now that it's directly related to providing advice to the board on our, on really our purview, that that will be a more satisfying uh, process <coughs> for you all and also I think for us, because it certainly is frustrating for us to get uh, really good information and really good recommendations that then we don't have any authority to really do anything with. So I just wanted to uh, hope that for the best for our, our new reconstituted charge. Um, and, and on the primary care spend, I know that our staff has been following those bills related to the primary care spend. We, we did a baby step in the ACO budget to start to test that. It's not really, I don't think it accomplished what we were hoping for, but that's certainly something that I think um, I'm very interested in uh, us looking at. One caution, I think, on the ROI in Rhode Island is that they had not really implemented patient-centered medical homes, and they were hoping to kind of do that at the same time. So there could be some conflation there in the savings between work of the patient-centered medical home and the increase in spending. But regardless, I, for me personally, I think that it's a very interesting concept and uh, hope that we'll consider uh, looking at that more in the future. Other questions from the board? Comments? I don't have any questions. I just want to thank you very much for, for coming. And um, I've attended a couple of the recent PCAD meetings and found a lot of your insights incredibly helpful in some of the work that we've already been doing. Um, and I'm looking forward to you know, more conversations. Thank you. So I too want to thank you and uh, just want to share my frustration because some of the administrative burdens we've been talking about these for more than a few years, <laughs> more than a decade. We don't seem to be making uh, the progress that we should be making. And I've said repeatedly that workforce is the biggest crisis facing medicine in the state of Vermont. And it's not just uh, a lack of new graduates, but it's also keeping people in, in the uh, workplace. And be perfectly honest with you, Dr. Horn, I'm about to fail on your two quality measures because my primary care doctor is retiring, and despite my wife telling me repeatedly, <laughs> repeatedly that I had to get out and find another primary care doctor before the retirement date, I'm a week away, and I don't even know how I'm going to get the records if I don't find somebody quickly, so that uh, is very scary, and I know that one of the things I, I said is, you know, we're getting older, I should be finding a younger doctor. Well, good luck with that. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's it's a, a real problem. And, you know, until people are willing to make the, the decisions that are, are willing to make changes, it's, it's not going to go away. And you know, you try to take solace in, in small things that have happened. We've seen. Uh, you know, prior off through one year and things like that. Um, but again, it certainly doesn't seem to be enough. And I can tell you that my primary care doc who's retiring next week is his last week. I can remember the time when he told me that if he had to do electronic medical records, he would retire. But he somehow managed to, to live through that whole uh, um, change in medicine. But uh, he's ready to call it quits. And, you know, I don't think there's anything that anybody can do or say that's uh, going to change his mind. And everybody should be allowed to retire at some point in time anyways. <laughs> so um, with that, I just want to thank you and open it up to the public for any comments or questions. And Chair Mollick, can I just say one other thing? Sure. Um, uh, just to tie both of these parts of the conversation together, I, I have taken down some notes on some of the things that I think it would be helpful for us to go back to the PCAD with on what what they can do to inform you. I mean, this is great to hear um, kind of anecdotal information, but I think it I'm, I'm definitely hearing workforce as a as a real issue on both sides. So um, I I want to make sure that we follow up um, with the PCAD so we can potentially find some real solutions to these issues. Can I actually manage to add something? Because you jogged my memory a little bit. So, you know, we have had the conversations. We had a panel uh, about administrative burden, um, and prior off. I just want, uh, you know, in the last month, 
we have continued conversations with carriers about gold carding. So we haven't forgotten about it, and those conversations continue. And uh, from what we're hearing, there's, there's conversations happening at the carriers about how they might move forward with some potential gold carding initiatives. So I just want to update you all that, that hasn't, we have not forgotten that. That's great. Okay. Yes, Paul. I just want to back up and sense to what uh, Chairman Mullen said in the family practice that I go to. In the last 10 years, I've been through four primary care providers. They've all gone to the hospital, retired, or whatnot. And who knows how long the one that I have now is. He is actually younger than me, surprisingly. You're doing pretty good. I <laughs> snared him pretty good. We're both skiers. Uh, another comment I want to address what one of the speakers said is about access, and I have two comments on that. One is concerning the bills. We've been trying to do a universal primary care bill for the last four years, and it's got absolutely nowhere. This year, SH-129 did not even get off the wall of the House Health Committee. I'm not sure about S-53. I don't know if that's, I think it's just the study or something like that. I haven't really delved into the bill yet, but the will to do something like this is simply not there up in the dome, up in the building. They don't want to have anything to do with it. They want to push it somewhere else. The money, you can go for this or that, but in the meantime, I wrote a commentary in the Vermont Digger that was actually published yesterday on the struggles that ordinary Vermonters have to do sometimes to get insurance, to get access into primary care. And that details what I had to do, and that's just one person. You know, I had troubles with insurance and with Medicaid, and when I went into the doctor after getting all of that, they discovered that I have a condition that could be fatal down the road. Genetics, basically, and is the problem. But if I hadn't, I actually had to go through Vermont Legal Aid, and no one should need a third party advocate advocating for them simply to get into a primary care. But the problem, as one of the presenters said, is access. And until we have the moral and political courage I don't mean the board, I mean the legislature um, and our society. We're never going to be able to tackle this. We're not going to do it through one care. We're not going to do it through trying to push the buck, kick the can down the road so they don't have to pay for it, which is what's really going on. But more and more Vermonters are having so many problems accessing because of the way the insurance system, $500 for an insurance premium, one and then you got a deductible and you know, I talked to one woman last night who deliberately keeps her salary just above minimum wage so she can just get access to health care. This is the problem. Thank you, Walter. Yeah. Other comments or questions from the public? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. <laughs>